Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a privilege and a, a joy, you know, to share God's word together with us this morning. And I trust that God will meet us where we are in the name of Jesus. Um, this morning, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we'll be reading from verse 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 25 to 34. I read, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He said, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into burns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow we worry about its own things, sufficient for the day is his own troubles. Amen. Amen. Today we'll be looking at the topic that I titled, Do Not Worry. Do not worry. Let's have a quick word of prayer before we move in. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. The Bible says that the entrance of the word gives light and understanding to the simple. Lord, our hearts are open this morning to receive your word. That the light of your word will shine into our hearts, O oh God. And that we will respond in obedience to your word, to the glory of your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 amen. So as I said, we'll be looking at the topic, do not worry. While, while trying to prepare for this message, I was just trying to look around like what, what exactly is worry. And I saw, I saw a quote somewhere that I found interesting. I'm going to read it out right now. It says, worry is a vote of no confidence in God. It is trying to handle by yourself the very life you claim to have surrendered to Jesus. It says worry is an indirect way of telling God that he is incompetent and not dependable. <laughs> this sounds like very hard words, hard description. But when I, when I gave it a thought, I'm like, yes, that's worry. When we worry, we question, we question the, the character and the nature of God. We are basically saying we can be a better God than God himself. Amen. Worry reveals that we have, made a, we have made an idol of certainty. We want to know the exact details of every event. We want to know the timing, how it's going to happen, when it will happen, in what fashion it's going to happen. But we know the God of the Bible, he, he will not always give us details about our lives. Look at Abraham. He told Abraham, leave your kindred, leave your nation, go to the land that the place that I will show you. What is the name of the place? He didn't say, I will show you. How will I know when I get there? Nothing. I will show you. Praise God. Look at what the writer of Hebrews said concerning Abraham. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing, not knowing where he was going. Abraham did not know where he was going. Yet, he trusted God. Worry makes an idol of certainty. Amen. For the rest of the time we have in this, in this, in this service, we're going to be looking at our text, Matthew chapter 6. I believe Jesus wants us to learn a few things from this, from this portion of scripture that will help us in trusting in him and that will help us in overcoming worry, that will help us in overcoming anxiety. I'm going to look at five things this morning. I believe that Jesus wants us to look at, number one, the command not to worry. Number two, the rationale for why we should not worry. Number three, the observation that eradicates worry. 
Number four, the futility of worry. And number five, the mission of those who are freed from worry. So we're looking at number one, the command, the rationale, the observation, the futility, and the mission. These five things, I believe, will help us in coming, in quieting our spirits to depend on God. Let's look at the first one, the command not to worry. Three times, three times in this scripture, within these 10 verses, Jesus said, do not worry. Three times. If you look at verse 25, he says, do not worry about your life. Verse 31, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Jesus is giving a command here, do not worry. He's not providing some kind of suggestion or idea. He's giving an imperative, do not worry. Jesus is invariably saying, worry is a sin. <laughs> this might sound shocking to us because, I mean, we cannot see worry as second nature. It's something that we do all the same. Like, even if we know it's not good, we just find ourselves worrying. The temptation to worry is not it is normal, it's normal. But when we yield, yielding to the temptation to worry is what is unchristian, it's not Christ-like. Do not worry, do not worry. Worry is a sin. Paul, Paul, in, in, he also reiterates this command in the book of Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven. The Bible says that be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Not your job, not your children, not your finances. Be anxious for nothing. Say, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, he said, let your request be made known unto God. And in verse 7, he said, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, he said, he will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, rather than worry, convert those worries to prayers. Convert those worries to prayers. Yes, there's a temptation to worry. Maybe you're having health challenges. There's a temptation to be worried about your health. He said, convert those worries to prayers. Trust God as your healer. You're having challenges with your finances. He's your provider. Trust God. You have children. You're concerned about them. He said, trust. Instead of worrying about them, trust God concerning them. Convert your worries to prayers. Why will Jesus even say, do not worry? Why would he say that? I mean, if Jesus says do not cheat or do not, do not, do not steal, that's fine. But do not worry. I mean, I'm not hurting anybody by worrying, right? Like I'm just, it's just within me. I'm not hurting anyone. But I believe that one of the primary reasons that Jesus <laughs> commands that we should not worry is because worry reveals the idols of our hearts. The, 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 the substitute gods that we have trusted for our, for our satisfaction and value. I mean, in, in the 21st century, when we talk about idols, we think, oh, that doesn't concern us. I mean, it's, uh, it's for the Old Testament people. We think about some, you know, some objects that people bow down to. But even that form of idolatry starts from the heart first before it translates to, to the physical bowing down. An idol, an idol is anything or anyone that competes for our devotion, our time, our affection for God. Anything or anyone that competes for our time, for our affection, our love, and our devotion with God. An idol doesn't have to be something bad. It can be a good thing, blessing from God, our job, our family, money. These things are good things, but the moment they start to compete with our, our devotion, our service to God, they become idols. And it's clear in scriptures. The Bible tells us very clear in scriptures. If you look at our, our text again, we started from verse 25. Look at how verse 25 started. It said, therefore, do not worry. Meaning, I mean, from the basics of English language, we know that we don't just start a conversation with therefore. I can't just say, therefore, how are you? When we see therefore, it means that we're trying to come to a conclusion based on some previous statements, right? So if you look at verse 24, which is the preceding verse, it said, no man can serve two masters you either hate one and love the other or you are loyal to one and you despise the other he said no man can serve you cannot serve god and mammon you cannot serve god and money then he said therefore do not worry meaning jesus is placing a parallel between worry and and service to, and, and serving mammon which is actually the, the context of this whole, this whole portion of scripture. Jesus was admonishing us about how we respond as Christians to the material things of this world, to wealth, to clothing, to things of, of this world. So to worry about money is to serve money. 
to worry. What is it that you will lose? That you will be so devastated. You will be so devastated for. To worry about, about money is to sell money. To worry about your job is to serve your job. That's what the Bible says. To worry is to serve that thing. And Jesus is saying, no, we should not. We should not serve it. Don't do it. Do not worry. Amen. Let's go to the second point. The rationale on why we should not worry. Jesus has given us a command not to worry. And he's, he's so merciful. To, to, to appeal to our sense of logic, to let us, to ask us to reason, think about it. I mean, Jesus does not even need to give any rationale. I mean, if he says, do not do something or do something, it's good enough. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord of our lives. His command is perfect and true. But he, he, he appeals here yeah, to our sense of logic, asking us some questions. If we go back to our, our text in verse 25, it says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. He said, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This is, a, this is a rhetorical question that Jesus is asking, obviously. But for a moment, let's think about it. Life, life. Can you buy life anywhere? Now we're comparing life to food. Your body. Think about the intricacies of your body, your nervous system, respiratory system, your kidneys, everything. Compare that with raiment, with clothing. Jesus is comparing the greater to the lesser. If I can give you life, I am more than able to give you food. If I can give you, if, if I've given you a body, I can provide clothing for you. He's comparing, he's saying, look at my faithfulness. Look at what I have done for you. God's faithfulness is enough reason not to worry about what we are going through right now. His past faithfulness, his goodness in our life is enough reason not to worry. Hallelujah. In fact, we need, we need to raise what Samuel calls an Ebenezer. Now, the, the children of Israel, they were, they were fighting battles with the Philistines and, and they, had, they had won some battles. And Samuel took, took up a stone and he named it Ebenezer saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. Even though we, are, we still have some battles to fight, but thus far the Lord has helped us. We might be going through challenges in our health now, but thus far the Lord has helped us. Challenge it in our workplace, with our children, with our finances. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Look at the faithfulness of God in our lives. In fact, the cross is God's eternal Ebenezer. Even though we say, oh, God has not done anything for me. What God did on the cross through his son Jesus, giving, him his, giving us his best for our salvation is enough. Is enough. God's, the cross is God's eternal Ebenezer. Worry is irrational in the light of the cross. When you think about the goodness of God, how he gave him his, his son for us, is enough reason not to worry. Praise God. So yes, we see that God, Jesus is saying, do not worry. Do not worry. Even that be, be based on my past faithfulness, do not worry. He's all, he, he also said something else here. He was still, still on the second point of rationale. That one of the reasons why we should not worry is because of the fatherhood of God. God is our father. He cares about you. He cares about me. If you go back to our text in verse, in verse 26, the latter part of verse 26, he said, yet your heavenly father feeds them. That means talking about the birds of the air. He, he feeds them. In verse 32, he said, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. God is our father. God is our father. We can lift up our, our hand and say, Abba, father. God is not some distant deity that cannot be reached. He cares about you. So, so worry is irrational in the light of the fatherhood of God, in the, in the light of who our father is. So let's, let's quickly move on. He said, number one, the command not to worry. The rationale, why we should not worry. Number three, we'll be looking at the observation that eradicates worry. The, the observation that eradicates worry. Let's go back to our text. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Verse 26. It says, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bands, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Verse 28, he said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of this. Look at it. See, see, see the choice of words here. 
Verse 26, he said, look, look at the birds. <laughs> Verse 28, he said, consider the lilies, the flowers, the lilies of the field. Jesus is saying, we should observe. In fact, the, the KJV says, behold, behold the birds. The, the, Greek, the Greek word here means it's emblepo, which means to look intensely, to gaze upon. That's even a stronger word, to look, to focus, observe, observe the faithfulness of God in the natural order. Look at what God has done, even in nature. And there's this popular hymn, you know, a very popular hymn that says, Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder say, Consider all the works thy hands has made. I see the stars, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. He said, My thy power throughout the universe is placed. Then sings my soul, my savior, God to thee, how great thou art. The writer is he's, he's observing the brilliance, the power, the wisdom of God in the natural order. The stars, the thunder. Look at the sun, the rising and falling on the side of the sun. Look at the birds of the air. They don't have any accounts, bank account. They don't have any insurance. God takes care of them. He said, look at the, look at the leaves of the field, the flowers. The Bible says, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God can be so concerned and care for the natural, the things of the natural, how much you, his son, his daughter, he cares about you. He cares about you. So the faithfulness of God in the natural order is enough reason not to worry. Praise God. Praise God. Let's move on. Number four, the futility of worry. The futility of worry. <laughs> Worry is, worry is unproductive. It doesn't achieve anything. Worry does not achieve anything. In fact, we know from science that worry even sometimes causes physical illness, affects our mental health. Worry is ineffective, unproductive. It achieves nothing. If we go back to our text again, in verse 27 of our text, Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, he says, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? No one. Another, another version of the Bible says, which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? No one. Worry does not produce anything. In fact, somebody once des described worry as a rocking chair that gives you work to do, but takes you nowhere. So you have the illusion that you're working, that you're doing something, but you're still in the same spot. Worry achieves nothing. Worry is unproductive. Worry is ineffective. Amen. Let's go back to our text in verse 34. In verse 34 of our text, the Bible says that, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow we worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Listen, I like the fact that Jesus did not say that we will not have troubles. You know, sometimes as Christians, we think that because we're in Christ, we're exempted from the troubles and challenges of this world. But Jesus is not saying that. Jesus said that you will have troubles. You will definitely have troubles because we live in a fallen world. You will have troubles. You will have challenges. But Jesus is saying, worry is not what will prepare us for the troubles of life. Worry will not solve the problem of our troubles. That's what he's saying. He said he would receive, he said we will receive strength for tomorrow's troubles tomorrow. Sometimes we want to receive the strength for tomorrow's troubles today. We want to figure everything out right now. Even though something we want, anything we want to achieve in two years or three years' time, we want to get the entire picture right now. We want to be in control of things. But Jesus is saying, no, there's no need to worry. Worry cannot give you strength for tomorrow. Worry cannot, worry can, worry it takes from you. Worry cannot add to you. Worry cannot give you strength. You know what can give you strength? To meditate on God's word. Instead of worrying about your challenges that you cannot have, that you don't, that cannot, that cannot change anything. Why not meditate on God's word? Why not meditate on the gospel? Meditate on the gospel. Somebody said that worry, wh whoever worries can meditate. All you need to do is just change the content of that worry and, and put the gospel or put God's word. We need to meditate on God's word instead of worrying. Meditate on the gospel of Jesus. Think about the law of Jesus. When there's a temptation to worry, think about the law of Jesus. That the father sends his son and he came willingly of his own 
He said that no one took my life. I gave it willingly. Think about it. Think about the power of the cross. That the head of the serpent has been crushed by the seed of the woman through Jesus. Think about the wisdom of the cross. That Jesus in one single event could, could fulfill the justice of God and, the, and showed mercy to man. Hallelujah. Jesus, I mean, the spirit of God dwells in us. He has given us the power to live a consistent life of victory over worry. Think about the fact that Jesus was re is risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you, interceding for me. Why should we worry when Jesus is praying for us? Why should we worry? Worry is irrational in the light of the gospel. When we think about the gospel, worry is irrational. Jesus at the cross came to solve the biggest problem of mankind. The biggest problem is not what we go through right now. It's not some challenges with our, with our finances or with our health. That's not the biggest problem of man. The biggest problem, the ultimate problem of man is sin and separation from God. That is what can eternally destroy us. Whatever we are going through right now, at worst, at the end of our, when it's time for God to call us to glory, that's where it ends. But sin can destroy us eternally. And Jesus came through the cross to solve that problem. He came, he laid down his, he, he, paid, he paid the demands of the law. He laid down his life. That we, we who, who were once without Christ, without hope in, in this world, separated from the commonwealth of Israel can now be drawn closer to God by the blood. That's what God has done for us in Christ. It takes the revelation of the gospel to overcome worry. It takes a, continue, a consistent meditation on his world to overcome worry. Because yes, challenges will always be there. But we need to consistently feed, feed on his word, fill our minds with the gospel of Jesus. Remind ourselves of his faithfulness on the cross. Praise God. Praise God. To the last point. God has given us a mission. He has given us a mission. A mission. For those of us who are freed from worry, he has given us a mission. In verse 33, which is a very common, a very common scripture. It says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, and all these things shall be added to you. When we, when, when we, when we give ourselves to Jesus, when we focus on him, when we turn our eyes on him, we are free from worry. We are free from anxiety and we're able to fulfill his mission on the earth, which is to seek his kingdom to seek his righteousness, to, to, to spread the, in, the influence of the, of the king across the earth, to, manage, to preach the gospel to people around us. When we are worried, we cannot be productive, we cannot be effective in this mission that God has given us. When we are encumbered with worry and anxiety, there is no how we can fulfill this mission that God expects us to do. We'll be likened to, 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 to the seed that was sown in the, in that, was, that was thrown among the tongues. The Bible says that the cares of this life, the worries of this world, choke the world and make them, make them, make them unfruitful. So if we, if, we, if, we are, if we keep on worrying, there is no how we can be fruitful in the mission that Jesus has given us. To seek his kingdom. To seek his righteousness on the earth. To preach the gospel to people around us. Many times when we, when we, when we, when we bring this scripture up, it's, it's many times we, we, want, we are desiring earthly things. Then we use this scripture to say it. So for instance, I, I, I'm, I'm seeking for, for promotion at work. And somebody says, you want promotion? Matthew 6, 33. Seek you first the kingdom. So that you can have promotion. If that is the motivation, you are actually not seeking the kingdom. You are actually seeking that promotion first, and you are using the kingdom, seeking the kingdom as, as a means to an end. The priority is to seek His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Now, these things is not just anything we need according to His will and in His perfect time. Sometimes, what God wants, what God wants for us might be different from what we, what we want. But as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to us. Church, there is work to do. There are sinners out there that need to hear the gospel. 
They are believers that need to be strengthened in their faith. They need to grow in the understanding of the word of God. We cannot sit down and keep worrying about over, over temporal things. I know it's not easy in the flesh, but God has given us his power. He has given us the ability, the strength, the power to live a life that is, that is free from worry, that, overcome, that is free from worry. So I want to admonish us today. I want to admonish us today that let's trust God. Yes, there are challenges, especially in this time and age, there are challenges. But let's trust God. Let's trust God. Remember his faithfulness on the cross. And let's make up our minds to fulfill what God has called us to do on the planet of the earth. Praise God. Let's, in just, let's just spend a minute or two just to, just to come and thank God for this message. And let's just ask God that, Lord, we receive strength today. We receive strength. We receive strength. Let's ask in one minute. We receive strength. Lord, give us strength, oh God. That will be victorious over worry, over anxiety. In the name of Jesus, we will be, we'll be victorious over, over the challenges of life. That will not allow the challenges of life to weigh us down. Help us, oh God, to be focused on you, to trust in you with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our heart. Let's lift up our voice, Lord, we thank you, we trust you, oh God, Jesus. That will fulfill the mission you have done for us, you have, you have given to us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for all you have done for us. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the privilege again to share your word. Lord, we know that we go through challenges and troubles of life, but help us, oh God, to be obedient to your word. Thank you because of your promise that you have given unto us that we have the power to overcome worry. Help us, oh God, to, to walk in the reality of that power you have given unto us. And help us, oh God, to fulfill your mission on the earth. To seek your kingdom. To spread the news of the king to enforce your righteousness on the earth and that your name alone will be glorified in our lives. Thank you, Father, for all you have done for us. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, his goodness, his message shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Have a good day. God bless you all and stay blessed.